Uh oh. Uh oh. Major upset alert. The Southern Jaguars can lay claim to the Kings of Baton Rouge as they knocked off LSU in their biggest victory of the year. Oh, yeah. It's locked on, HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor and current contributing writer at USA Today Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me. Make a Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. We wrap up today's episode with groundbreaking news. I'm actually extremely excited for every single one of these topics. It's rare that I have a show where I love topics one through three but i absolutely love this i think that every single one of these three every single one of these three topics could have led the show but something had to go first second and third and what goes third is alabama state is breaking down the door for hbcus to begin having women's college of uh, flag football prior to that Jackson State is ready to back up the Brinks truck, and they're ready to roll out the red carpet in a big bag for Tamika Reed. Let's look at the projected and reported contract that Jackson State is trying to offer. But we kick off today's episode with, I would say, the biggest news of April 1st. And I know we now sit here on April 3rd, but this happened late on Monday. I'm now sitting here recording late on on tuesday but the southern jaguars can lay claim to the king of baton rouge because their baseball team just went and they knocked off lsu at their home campus right they didn't do it at southern even though it's only across the street right like southern lsu it ain't far at all but the fact that southern went to lsu's campus and knocked them off in baseball is a big deal and this is arguably the biggest victory of the season now not only is this a big school, this is also the school that is right there with you, right? Like this is the biggest school in the state and you share the city with them. So I think that component of both being in Baton Rouge is a big deal, right? So that's why I say Southern can claim to be the king of BR for this year. So you have the fact that Southern and LSU are in the same city. Check. That's a big bragging rights type of thing. Then you look at the fact that LSU is a really good baseball school. Matter of fact, they won the College World Series last year. Check. So it's not just some Rudy Poo, right? You ain't just knock off some scrub Power 5 school. But let's say they're resting on their laurels, right? They're, they're not who they were last year. Well, this year, they're the 18th ranked team in the nation. So now you just beat a top 25 ranked team in baseball. Check. So when Southern knocked off LSU, they knocked off the biggest school in the city, the biggest school in the state. They knocked off a team that just won the College World Series the year prior, and they also knocked off the current 18th ranked team in the nation. Those three checks all set up for a pretty freaking big victory for them, and this is a statement victory. But for me, Southern knocking off LSU is big and can stand alone, right? Like that could be the only thing that we talk about. But at the same time, this victory was indicative of how Southern has been playing for a while now. They won eight of their last nine games, most notably highlighted by their victory over LSU. But beyond just that, in this stretch, the bats have been coming alive. They put up 12 runs against LSU. But in this stretch, there have only been two games in the last nine games that they played in which they didn't put up 10 or more runs. And they say good things come in threes. And that's kind of what happened for Southern against LSU, right? So you have Hawkins, three-run homer. Then you have Allison a three run RBI, right? Like, like this is, they put up 12, 
But before you notice it, three in the second inning, three in the fifth. Then you pair it with two more later on in the fifth. Now you're looking at, before you go into the bottom of the fifth inning, you're up eight to two. And that's really what gave you the breathing room. That's really what allowed you to feel comfort because now you're up six runs. And yes, you know that LSU can come back. They can put up six runs. But you've been batting really well. You've been batting really well. It ended up that LSU only put up seven, so they wouldn't have came back. But Southern did right and gave themselves some breathing room by adding on four more. So now they ended up getting 12, end up winning 12 to seven. But when I say that they've been batting really well, it's also the power hitting because Southern has the most home runs in the conference at 25. They're tied for that first place, but they haven't just loaded up a bunch. They haven't just loaded up a bunch. Southern put up 12 against LSU, and this is coming off of a 22-run uh, game, right? So you put up 12 against LSU, but the game prior against Prairie View, you put up 22. So they've been batting really well. But this isn't just loading up late. This is the most consistent stretch of power hitting that you've seen from Southern all year long because they've had one instance prior to this in which they put up multiple home runs and back-to-back games. They put up multiple home runs in four games in a row now at this point. So they went two, three, three, and then two. This is, and to be fair, three is the most home runs they've ever had in the game. They've had that twice now in the last four. They, they didn't just get a six, seven run home run game like like that didn't happen. So I think that that's important to notice because they've been a pretty good model of consistency. They've been putting in a couple of home runs here, there, one here, three here and here. It, it's been well spaced out. And that's how I trust it, because when you get into later in the season, then I'm going to be like, OK, was it just a spurt or is this who you are? And when I've seen you do this consistently, that's when I begin to feel like this is who you are. Southern has been great. And then you look at the the extra weight off of the field, right? Like once you leave the diamond, what does this victory mean? This is the fifth time that Southern has beaten LSU in baseball. And it's the first time they've beaten LSU on LSU's campus since 2005. Now, you went from winning in 05 to going all the way to 2019. So then you went from 2019 to 2024. The gap shortened. The gap is shortened, so maybe you can get another victory in 2027, right? Maybe you can cut it in half again or something like that, or cut it in third. So let's say 2026, right? That's as close as I can get to a third of five. But this was a big-time victory. You can lay claim to being the king of New York, the king of New York, the king of Baton Rouge. Sorry, y'all, I got Kendrick on the mind. Y'all got to forgive me. I'm thinking about control. But this is a huge deal. This is a huge deal, and overall, when you look at what Southern has been able to do over the last nine games, yes, their victory over LSU highlights it, but they've also won six straight uh, SWAT games. You've seen how they've been batting as of recent. They put up double-digit runs in nearly every game except for two in their last nine. This is this is the type of run that builds confidence in the team, and it's the type of run that builds confidence from the fans that when the going gets tough, you'll be able to knock one over the fences if you need to. Speaking of knocking one over the fences, that's exactly what Tamika Reed has been doing year after year after year. But as of right now, she is no longer the Jackson State women's basketball head coach. But <laughs> but Jackson State is about to roll out the Brinks truck because they got a big bag in hopes of enticing her to come back. Let's break down the potential offer and how they could spice it up as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Fire TV, and the Final Four is here. It'll be back on Friday. Then, you know, the NCAA tournament will be done on Monday. Like, that's how quickly that we're getting to closing this thing out. The best event in college basketball is about to be over. But don't miss the last moments just looking on your phone. Go ahead and go to your Fire TV. That's the best place for March Madness, even though there's three games on both sides left. The NBA is heating up. You can catch the highlights. You can catch the analysis. You can catch everything in between. It's on you to go to Fire TVs, right? Then also, 
go to the fire tv channels that's where you can catch the highlights analysis breakdowns you can um the quick reviews all of those things on your fire tv channels and you'll be able to see a guy like me on a locked on uh locked on sports today so it's easy decision if you ask me go to amazon.com slash locked on fire tv to learn more if you aren't already sold As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day for your second listen. Make sure you're checking out Locked on Sports today. First of its kind, 24-7, all day, every day, live sports network on YouTube. Go to Locked on Sports today and subscribe. It sounds like Jackson State is preparing a monumental, huge contract for Tamika Reed. It sounds like they're prepared to to back out the Brinks truck. And I think it's a smart investment, right? But when we speak about backing up the Brinks truck, what does that mean? And speak about family. Yard Talk, I'm setting up my camera to record. Yard Talk, Yard Talk hit me. I said, let me see what this is. Boom. And she gave me the proper figures that I needed to use as a reference point for Tamika Reed. The reported contract was four years $250,000 per year. That totals out to a million dollars over four years. And I already knew that was a big contract, but I wanted to relate it. I had to think about something. Willie Simmons, when he was at FAMU, was getting a base salary of $300,000. And that term base salary is where this all comes down to. To me, that's the most interesting part about it. Because if it's a four-year, let's just go year by year. If it's $250,000 base salary, that's drastically different than up to $250,000 because I'm going to assume that there'll be some sort of incentives tied on to it, but it's about does the, do the incentives add up to $250,000 or is it $250,000 and you have the ability to build on that foundation? Those are two completely different contracts. If it's a base salary of two fifty, dollars that's close to Willie Simmons getting his three hundred dollars at FAMU as a football coach. We're talking about a women's basketball coach here. But then... That's when what Yard Talk brought up really came to me. And she brought up Coach Jackson's figures at Jackson State. This is a men's basketball coach, but it's in the basketball arena. So to me, it fit, right? And what he's making is a base salary of 215000 to 235000 It escalates, right? So you're looking at Coach Jackson getting that, but then he's getting incentives for each thing. The most important part here and this is what yard talk really brought to my attention and i thought was great grambling has it in his contract where adidas not the school but adidas will pay incentives in relation to his success yes the school for example if if grambling wins the swag tournament the school has to pay coach jackson five thousand dollars but then adidas pays $50,000. If Jackson State can pull something off like that, it's a win-win because you've seen the success that Tamika Reed has. So maybe you might be fearful of putting too high incentives because you know you're going to end up paying that money out. But if Under Armour does it, now it's, that's, a, that's a completely different conversation. If Under Armour is paying her $50,000 for winning the SWAT tournament, different conversation if they're paying her twenty five thousand for being the swat coach of the year that's a different conversation you can have a higher base salary from you if you have those incentives from the company when grambling did that i think that that's what jackson state should look to emulate but once again if she's getting 250 base salary versus up to 250 that's going to be a big difference and that's what i'll be looking for overall if we're talking incentives grambling has the mold if we're talking about base salary, oh my God, $250,000 a year, you're probably going to be one of the three highest basketball paid coaches in the SWAC period to keep doing what I've already been doing. I've told you before, I do not believe that she is in a rush to leave Jackson State. This only would reaffirm that. If we're speaking about $250,000, we're talking about being a top three paid coach regardless of gender. To keep doing what I've been doing, to keep dominating these people like I've been dominating these people, then I really don't feel the need to itch and go somewhere else. If Tennessee comes to call it and Tennessee offers me the job, then maybe they still do because they probably going they gonna pay her more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? But I'm not reaching. 
for any job. I'm only going to go to places where I feel extremely comfortable. And I think that this contract will give her even more of the luxury, right? I think she would have done that because that's where her heart is. Now she can do that because that's where her pockets are. And that's completely different. Now, one thing I will say, don't stress her interviewing, right? She interviewed for Tulane. She didn't get it. They went another direction. But interviews are part of this process. I will be way more stressed that they let it get here because I don't know what that's about. I don't know if Tamika wanted to just see what, what was out there. I think she could have done that under contract, but maybe there's certain things she could and couldn't do and she didn't want any restrictions. I don't know. Um, I don't know why Jackson State wouldn't have got this done a year prior. I'm not even letting Tamika Reed get into the last year of her, of her contract ever. Like that's never happening. So maybe came down to money. There's so many things that it could be, but I'd be way more concerned about the contract ending than her interviewing. This is a part of the process. Look at um, Amaya Simmons at Alabama A&M. From what I hear, she wants to be with Alabama A&M. She wants to be a lady bulldog. But at the same time, she wants to know what everything has to offer because there's some uncertainty. That's how I look at it with Tamika Reed. Tamika Reed or any coach in general in their contract expiring is very similar to a kid going into the transfer portal. I would actually say it's less serious than that because kids go into the transfer portal. Most times they don't they don't come back. I'm just going to be honest with you. I said like, like it's a place of beyond no return. They don't come back. You go in that portal, you, you ain't coming back. But no, like in all seriousness, when they go into the portal, I would say most times, eight, nine times out of ten, they're not. They're, they're, they're leaving. They want it to go and they'll find somewhere else to go. But with a coach who's not under contract and who's just listening, first off, it's not all the way up to them. There's going to be teams who they interview for who won't want them. There might be teams that interview them. They say, we don't want that. But it's about exploring the options. That's what Tamika Reed is doing. She doesn't have Tulane. I wouldn't have scoffed at that job anyway. I could have seen her taking that Tulane gig. But Tennessee is open. We'll see if Tennessee does it. Tennessee does it, they're going to throw a bag. If Tennessee wants Tamika, I think she might be gone. 250 or no 250. Incentive or no incentive. This is going to be very interesting. I'm actually going to have a lot of fun watching this. And I can't wait to update. When I tell y'all I love every single one of these topics, I'm not lying to you. I don't remember the last time I had a show where I could go from segment one to segment three and feel bad about not making each segment the opening one. We went from Southern putting on that crown the king of BR after knocking off LSU and baseball. Now we're looking at the Brinks truck offer that Jackson State is reportedly ready to offer Tamika Reed and how they can spice that up to make it a win-win for the coach and school. But now we look at Alabama State, because word to Pimp C, they're knocking doors down. And when I look at it, I think that this is a move that at least one other SWAC school should emulate because Alabama State is the first Division I HBCU to offer women's flag football as an NCAA sport. Let's break this down because this is huge as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and FanDuel is the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your bracket's been busted. Is that the Final Four? I know. I don't even need to remind you. I'm sorry that I did. Genuinely, I apologize. But who cares? <laughs> who cares that your bracket is busted? Because with FanDuel, that never mattered anyway. It never mattered. It's not about if you can get all the games right. It's about did you get this particular game right? And if you did, let's go on to the next game. If you didn't, let's go on to the next game. It never mattered. All you have to do is go to FanDuel. If you're new to FanDuel, you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. You put down the code locked on. Or excuse me, use the FanDuel.com slash locked on without the code. And you put down a $5 winning bet. You get $200 back in bonus bets. You have to win on that first $5 bet, though. It's really that simple. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. As long as the games are still being played, there's money to be made. Until they knock down and cut down the nets, go ahead and make sure you bet. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making it all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. Alabama State has just kicked down the door. They just knocked doors down. 
for women's flag football on an HBCU level. They just became the first Division I HBCU to offer women's college flag football. And this is something that I did not realize was such a big deal. When this became something, I said, I thought to myself and I said, interesting. And I love the fact that they picked the women's game first because they easily could have just had men's flag football, but they went women's first. And I, I like that because, you know, when I was younger, only thing about women's flag football was the powder puff games at homecoming. I'm just going to be real with y'all. Right. And I loved it. It was fun because I was a coach and I thought it was a lot of fun, even though I took it way too serious. Right. I was that kid out. Whatever, though. It's cool. I wouldn't do it that way now. But at that time, man, I was trying to I was on the game. You feel me? But this was this was, in my opinion, something that caught me extremely off guard. But as I did a little bit more research, it was something that made a lot of sense, specifically for Alabama State, because Alabama has 85 high schools that have high school flag football for women. That's why I think Alabama A&M should copy this, too, because obviously in the state of Alabama, this is a big deal. I don't know of this being a huge deal in the state of Texas. So I wouldn't say, hey, Texas Southern Prairie View. It makes sense for your geographic demographic. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. Right. Even though I, I wouldn't mind to see it, it'd be a cool little expansion. It, it's, it's nice because this is growing globally. They're going to have this in the 2028 Olympics, so not the one that's coming up this year, but the one after that. This is an Olympic sport. I didn't even realize that. So in my head, this was flag football was growing. I knew that, but I wasn't sure how low it was going. I feel like a lot of times we see things kind of go upward. So maybe high school, then college, then pros, then, but with flag football, it feels like it's been a trickle down effect. Like it feels like I remember seeing I'm on NFL Network. I'm watching them play flag football. So it's it's not quite professional, but it's whatever that is. Semi-pro, I guess. I guess they would probably classify it as that. But I'm watching them play this. And then now I'm seeing them going on the collegiate level. So now I'm looking. I'm like, okay, they doing it on the high school level too? It makes me want to go down the rabbit hole of how much is women's flag football being played? How much is flag football being played? I feel like in high school, it's not many men playing or, or the boys at that time playing flag football they're probably just told to go play football but women you know they're not putting on the pads at 16 17 right you have some women's football leagues out there but that's more so for once you get older this is a great setup it allows them to get into football because this idea that women don't like football extremely sexist extremely outdated this could help knock down that narrative right and I don't say that just to be like cliche or to be corny or anything. I think it's well proven by this point that there's a lot of women who like football, but we just know they can't play it because they're not going to the NFL. Now this is can this can become something. I think that women's flag football has legitimate legs and Alabama State being a part of the expansion is great. Them being an HBCU who has part of the expansion, I think that it will end up being really good because the NAIA has it. And they're probably playing high level because at the end of the day, girls, women's, however you want to phrase it, before they hit the age of 18, that that sounds crazy out of context. But the sport of flag football, girls flag football, that's already underrated. You bring in HBCUs, which is known for bringing in some of the underrated talent, the talent that is undiscovered. It's kind of a match made in heaven, and they don't have many places to go. This is not intramural. No disrespect to intramural. Lord knows I had some of my funniest moments, like probably two of my funniest moments in college were at intramural basketball. But this is an NCAA sport. And the fact that I'm sure that high school girls flag football is not looked at often by people. It's probably an overlooked sport for athletes. You look at HBCUs who is known for bringing in under-discovered, un underlooked, right? Athletes, boom, just bring them together. Now we can all grow the sport together. I love this. I think that this is phenomenal. Bring in those, those uh, hidden gems to a school that's known for bringing up hidden gems 
and let's watch the sport grow together. This is phenomenal. On tomorrow's episode, we'll be looking at Jamari Thomas, who left Norfolk State. He's entering the transfer portal. And let me be honest with you. I hate to see him go, but he checks all the boxes for a person who would be leaving HBCUs. I Just going on what I've seen in the past. And I'll tell you what I see when we get to the future. I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day, every day. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care. I'm so happy about this episode. Stay blessed. Peace.